will La Nina bring us a winter of horror? It's common knowledge that the powerful weather phenomena El Nino and La Nina have a global influence on the climate. But now experts fear that La Nina will show its bitterly cold face in just a few weeks. The bottom line, however, is that the climatic string pullers are even able to seal the fate of entire civilizations. But what is actually behind these phenomena? Why have La Nina phases in the past already triggered severe pandemics? And what extreme events should we prepare for in the future? A hot brother and his cool sister. While the arrival of El Nino is always accompanied by a warming anomaly in the eastern Pacific, La Nina, as its counterpart, triggers a cooling anomaly. Basically, we are dealing here with changes in the system of ocean and air currents in the equatorial Pacific. And together with the neutral phases, El Nino and La Nina form a kind of climate swing called El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO for short. The neutral, or normal phases, refer to the years in which the trade winds blow from east to west along the equator, over the Pacific, or in other words, from South America to Southeast Asia, pushing the warm water of the sea in front of them. As a result, the warm water masses accumulate off the coast of Southeast Asia, while the colder water from the deeper ocean regions flows off the coast of South America. The bottom line is that the Western Pacific is a few degrees warmer than the Eastern Pacific. But when an El Nino phase is on the horizon, which occurs on average every two to seven years and lasts about 12 months, the equatorial trade winds blow much more weakly or even stop blowing altogether. Normally, this happens in the fall and winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Consequently, the Pacific Ocean off South America warms up while it cools down off Southeast Asia. And in La Nina years, the wind shifts direction. In other words, the trade winds now blow much harder than in the neutral phases. This is usually the case every three to five years, although La Nina events can occasionally occur over several years. Either way, however, both phenomena are linked to direct, noticeable weather changes that have different but equally severe effects depending on the region. Accordingly, in El Nino years, the Pacific coast of North and South America tends to get wetter, simply because more water evaporates from the warmer Pacific. Conversely, La Nina causes greater dryness here. In Southeast Asia and Australia, however, this pattern is reversed. While El Nino brings increased droughts over the land here, La Nina manifests itself in the form of heavy rain and flooding. You might think that you are safe from the extreme weather outside of the affected areas, but that is not the case. This is because the ENSO system can actually also influence regions that are not in its direct catchment area via so-called teleconnections. For example, the Horn of Africa is more likely to experience droughts during La Nina phases. Since the European climate is primarily determined by the Atlantic, the direct effects of El Nino and La Nina events are only reflected in the statistical probabilities here. It is conceivable, for example, that it rains a little less in Scandinavia and a little more in Central and Southern Europe during El Nino years. Of Lost Civilizations and Winged Disease Carriers while La Nina leads to lower temperatures and El Nino causes the thermometer to climb, we should not forget that the corresponding weather changes have been affecting our everyday lives for much longer than just a few years. In fact, the term El Nino was already coined in the 17th century by South American fishermen. More precisely, they referred to the phenomenon as El Nino de Navidad, or Christmas Child, for the very simple reason that the climate anomaly usually reached its peak around Christmas time. Despite this, the fishermen did not have a particularly good time during such phases, because with the increasing influx of the El Nino years, fewer and fewer nutrients were washed up for the phytoplankton and the fish shoals, and the fishermen's nets often remained empty. Furthermore, El Nino is even suspected of having contributed to the downfall of some indigenous cultures. These include, for example, the Moshe culture, which was at home on the north coast of Peru from the 1st to the 8th century and probably fell victim to the severe storms unleashed by El Nino. In this regard, researchers at Ohio State University in Columbus 
have come to the conclusion that the cultures, mud, brick buildings, and fragile irrigation systems simply had no chance against the extreme weather events. But the conflicting brother-sister duo has also felt its dangerous mark in the recent past. In this regard, scientists have determined that the last major global influenza outbreaks, as well as the spread of swine flu in 2009, occurred immediately after a pronounced La Nina phase. But what do weather changes have to do with serious disease outbreaks? Well, it's quite simple. Climate change also has a direct influence on the behavior of migratory birds, and these, with their long journeys and many stopovers, are considered important helpers in the formation of new genetic strains of influenza viruses. In this context, migratory birds such as wild geese can transmit bird flu viruses to domestic poultry or even to other animal species. And if the infected animals are already infected with a different strain of the virus, the different types of virus can exchange genes and modify their genetic material. Ultimately, this recombination can produce an influenza virus that can no longer only affect birds, but also humans. A winter of horror? At this point, it's worth remembering that the European climate is mainly influenced by the Atlantic, which raises the question of what the winter of horror that La Nina is supposed to bring us is all about. At this point, it should perhaps be briefly noted that this term does not come from us, but rather determines the headlines of some articles that are currently buzzing through the net. But be that as it may, according to meteorologists, it's practically as certain as the Amen in church that the next La Nina phase is imminent. This is because the cold sister generally always follows in the footsteps of its warmer brother, and the past few months have indeed been dominated by El Nino. In Germany, for example, every month since June 2023 has set a new temperature record, and 2023 can also lay claim to the inglorious title of being by far the warmest year since weather records began. But now the weather scales could tip dramatically, because La Nina always replaces El Nino the World Meteorological Organization, WMO, assumes that bitterly cold temperatures could set in as early as fall, but by winter at the latest. And according to the calculations of the U.S. Climate Prediction Center, there is a 74% probability that Jack Frost will make himself comfortable in the Northern Hemisphere until January 2025. Whether the winter will really be as horrible as feared in the media remains to be seen. On the one hand, there are still major uncertainties regarding the intensity and duration of the early onset of winter. And on the other hand, La Nina only has an indirect influence on the weather in Europe. But in times when terms like climate change are part of everyday language, a completely different question arises. How will El Nino and La Nina actually develop in the coming decades? And above all, are we facing a mega El Nino in the future? Just how powerful the effects of El Nino can be is clear from what happened in Australia about a year ago. As early as the first half of September 2023, temperatures in some parts of Down Under were 10 to 16 degrees above the average for that month. And while the Australian Meteorological Service had officially declared the El Nino weather phenomenon at that time, the WMO went even further in May 2023, warning of a possible mega El Nino. According to this, the development of an El Nino would most likely lead to a new increase in global warming and increase the probability that further temperature records would be broken. This is a far from rosy prognosis, which was subsequently confirmed by a study published in the journal Nature. Based on a model calculation, the researchers determined that between July 23rd and June 24th, the average global air temperature could exceed historical maximum values with a probability of 90%. And a glance at the statistics shows that ENSO and the global climate are fundamentally closely linked. In recent decades, strong El Nino events have always been accompanied by new heat records in the oceans and the atmosphere. However, the bottom line is that the movements of the ENSO cycle can not only intensify the effects of climate change, but also mitigate them. Analyses have shown that we have just emerged from a triple La Nina. This was triggered by the fiery effects of the Australian wildfires of 2019 and 2020, and it caused global mean surface temperatures to remain at a plateau 
and not to rise further despite growing greenhouse gas emissions. However, La Nina did not really cancel out the consequences of greenhouse gas emissions. It merely masked them for a short time. In fact, after La Nina ended, global mean surface temperatures rose abruptly by 0.2 degrees. And while experts fear that El Nino and man-made warming will cause global temperatures to skyrocket in the future, climate change also has an influence on the overarching ENSO phenomenon. For example, this affects the shifting of large-scale air currents. At the same time, the warming seas cause the temperature gradient between the equator and the poles to weaken and precipitation patterns to change. And speaking of precipitation, if the subscription button has never been struck by the force of your click, you are welcome to change that now. So go ahead and click subscribe so you never miss a new video from us again. We'll see you soon.